following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search the Options Insider Radio in iTunes. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market updates and trading strategies. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. Break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your hosts, Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com, Mike Tusa from KnowYourOptionsInc.com, and John Grigas from Options Express. All right, and welcome to this inaugural episode of the Option Block, a veritable sneak peek, if you will. I know a lot of our listeners on the Options Insider Radio Network wrote in to us to say how much they enjoyed the steady stream of content we put out from the Options Industry Conference over the summer. And that nice steady stream of content actually allowed us to take a bit of a hiatus from live shows, which we were able to put towards some interesting new content ideas for our listeners. This is actually one of those new content ideas. It's a new program on the Options Insider Radio Network that we are calling the Option Block. And it allows us to bring in a few extra voices to the network. You don't have to listen to me drone on about the options market anymore. We actually have a few other hosts in here to help shoulder the hosting duties. And I'll introduce them for you right now, starting with Mike Tusaw from Know Your Options. Mike, welcome to the program. And why don't you give us a little bit of your background in the options business, as well as what you guys do over at Know Your Options. Oh, well, thank you, Mark. It's great to be here, as always. Uh, I work at, at Know Your Options, and what we do is we help people with either investing their money for them, or we work with people one-on-one -on -one as registered reps to help them to help themselves, so to speak. Uh, my background, I've been in the business for about eight years, uh, and before coming to Know Your Options, I was the director of education over at Options Express. Okay, great. Uh, we're also joined by Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com as well as ExpiringMonthly.com. And Mark, welcome to the show. And the same question for you. Tell our listeners a little bit of your background in the options business as well as what you guys do over at OptionPit and Expiring Monthly. Well, I am a former market maker on both the CBOE and the American Stock Exchange. Um, and uh, what OptionPit does... Option Pit is a full-service education firm meant to uh, help self-directed traders learn to manage risk, uh, pick trades, understand volatility the way all the market makers out there understand volatility. We, we try and take the individual investor that really wants to learn how to self-trade and, and get them to the next level. Um, Expiring Monthly, which is kind of a sister company, if you will, um, is uh, the combination of myself and four other relatively well-known option bloggers across the internet. Uh, we get together and we write a monthly magazine about what's going on in the option universe at that point in time. Um, for instance, last month we wrote about the weekly options. This month we're talking about directional plays. Um, as a, on a side note, I also do a, a risk management for a small hedge fund, and uh, I'm kind of published all over the country. Currently, I'm uh, I'm a staff writer for TheStreet.com as well. So, last but certainly not least, we have the rotating chair from Options Express, the Options Express Fellowship, so to speak. And today, that is filled by John Grigas. So, John, welcome to the show. And same question for you. Give us a little bit of your background in the options business and what it is that you do over at Options Express. Well, thanks, Mark, for having me in. Uh, quick side note, uh, good choice of music on the intro. Well, I just wanted to say that you had a great taste in music. Really got me pumped up. We, we had some great advisors on our musical selections. I will just say that much. I could tell. I could tell right away. Uh, my name is John Grigas. I've uh, been in the markets for about the last 15 years. Um, I held positions from a runner all the way up to a floor trader. 
and off-floor trader in pretty much uh, every position in between. Um, currently, I am heading up the trade desk at Options Express. Uh, we oversee about 20 different licensed brokers. Uh, if you are not familiar with Options Express, uh, which is the leading online stock options and futures broker, uh, pretty much a one-stop shop for uh, retail clients. And now that the intros are over, we can get into the meat of the show, starting with our first segment, the trading block. The trading block. Now, welcome to the trading block. This is where we break down the current market activity that we're seeing. And right now, today is, is a little bit interesting. Uh, it wasn't too much going on this morning. The market was kind of vacillating around a bit, a little bit lower. Now it's inching a bit higher. We had some conflicting news coming out of Philly Fed, where they said the economy was decent, but not as good as people thought it was going to be, maybe. And then also FedEx disappointed last night, that weighed on us coming into the opening. And then, of course, everyone's kind of concerned these days over this posturing coming out of Washington about the Chinese currency fluctuations and how China was too slow to adjust their currency. So I think the market is a little bit spooked now that we're going to see some pushback from China regarding its currency. Uh, what are you guys seeing out there? Well, I'll tell you one thing that I noticed today is what seems to be the, one of the, the market's favored stocks that doesn't seem to want to go away. Uh, that's Apple. Apple is moving. Uh, what are you seeing in Apple today, Mr. Mark? Well, you know, it is up. Uh, it's up about five, five and a half bucks, which is about 2%. And I'm looking at this paper flow, and it is one busy stock. Um, you've got people betting from all sides uh, about which way this thing can go. And we're looking at a volatility of about, uh, we're looking at an the money volatility of about uh, 28%. That's a pretty, pretty hefty move. Uh, that's a pretty hefty vol for a $275 stock. Um, now, Apple's certainly been higher in the past, but uh, just looking right now, this thing is, uh, there is players all over the field. Um, yeah, because we're getting close to that 279 mark, though, 52 weeks. That's what I was looking at. I mean, yeah, we yeah. Are, that's the highest it's been, $4 away. Yep, yep. So we're seeing guys that are betting it's going to be breaking through, and we're seeing the guys that are betting it's going to be uh, tanking. You know, some interesting spreads I'm looking at. We had a guy, looks like we had a pretty decent-sized trade, uh, somebody selling the 232.70 call spread, which is kind of an interesting trade. Um, and then uh, a couple of really interesting, uh, looking at some 270, 280 buyers out there, um, people that maybe don't want to go out and buy the stock but are willing to, to bet that uh, – this thing goes higher. Yeah, these are all Jans. Yeah, these are all Jan. The 270, 230 looks like it was a Jan spread. It looks like we're seeing some, just overall, some substantial options volume in Apple today. You know, their average daily volume is about 260,000 contracts, and they've already put up 330 with still a half hour left to go. So we're seeing a decent, uh, decent surge in the options contracts. The bulk of that appears to be call volume with about 200,000 calls going up. And uh, as well as about 125,000 puts. So, yeah, substantial volume on, on both sides. But I'm looking, looking here, and I agree with Mark. I don't see any uh, massive one individual trade that's taking up the bulk of that volume. It seems to be players across the board. Yep. They're seeing it's, the call volume is 1.6 to 1. So, we are seeing people, despite it running up near its high, out there buying puts. Um, although, I have to say, we have a net delta. There's been a net delta buy of about uh, the put delta has been pretty even, and uh, we've had a net delta net buyer in terms of delta of about uh, 815,000 deltas. So it's kind of interesting. I just want to go on record here. Is a couple of years ago, I was on a show, probably about the end of 2008, and they asked me for some picks, and I picked Apple down at like 88 or 90. And both of the wow. hosts of the show I was on looked at me like I was insane. This was the height of the implosion, and they both looked at me and said, who the hell is going to buy these premium price computers now? This thing's going to 50. And so I just want to come on record and say, yes, I was right two years ago. And, uh, were, and so I just uh, I want to dig up that tape just to, kind of, uh, just to kind of mock those hosts now. Yeah. But um, it's one of those 
those that's one of those ones that, that goes unheralded. But yeah, this stock yeah. here is this has been one of our uh, one of our favorites on the options inside. People write into us just about every day with questions and trade ideas and post in our forums about Apple. A lot of action on the weeklies. Well, you know, I sorry, I'm just looking at uh, you know, I I thought I I was messing around with Apple here, and I kind of noticed an interesting play. Um, the thing I like about uh, the thing I, I like about Apple is that everybody loves it, which makes me want to sell it. Um, but you know, you can only uh, not always just on Apple. I feel like. You know, Apple's like Apple's like the Prius of stocks. You know, like I see Priuses driving around, and I'm like, come on, really, Leonardo DiCaprio, really? Um, but uh, you know, I'm really afraid to just go out and get short or to buy puts or anything like that. So what I was looking at that's kind of interesting is some sort of ratio spread. And uh, what do you guys think about uh, this? All right. If you think Apple's going to tank, but you don't want to get just go out and buy puts, you sell the 280 puts one time, and you go out on a ratio, you buy two of the 260 puts. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I think if Apple heads back to 260, it's going to get there in a hurry, um, in which case you'll see kind of an increase in volatility. These puts will do really, really, really well. Um, and you don't mind losing on a little bit of the long belt from the 280s because you'll make up so much from the gamma from the 280 puts and the volatility increase. Now, if I'm wrong, which I've been known to do, it happens. Um, I, hey, you know what? It happens every once in a while. You know, sun shines. <laughs> I, uh, I assume you're talking October here, right? I'm, talk I'm looking at October. You can sell the 280 puts at about $10.40. You can buy two of the 260 puts for six dollars and thirty cents. Net credit of four bucks. Okay, so you end up with, uh, you know, if we rally, you can make four hundred, and if we fall off, you know, who knows how much you could make with uh, vol increasing. But just kind of looking at a scenario, if we're a week from now, which would be the 23rd, and we're trading at two hundred and fifty nine dollars you know we'll say 259 through the 260 strike which would be a drop but nothing ridiculous what is that um you know that would be five less than five percent okay and we see an increase in volatility of two percent now let's let's raise the vol a little more here let's say we we see a, an increase in vol of five percent you know you're starting to make money already and then if this thing goes to 250 bucks, you're going to be up a significant portion without having really risked a lot of capital, is what I like. Um, it's kind of a win-win. It's an interesting trade, and it's interesting, too. It's not, it's not really as, uh, it doesn't have much of a delta component as you would think. I think the the one by two ratio, pretty much, it makes it what, like a 10 delta or something like that. So it's a pretty uh, directionally almost neutral trade as well, until you get a really big move down to the 260 level. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So who knows? You know, let's, well, uh, I, let's move I, I do have to agree with Mark. One, one thing uh, rare that Mark being wrong in his trades is that I agree with him <laughs> in the fact that I believe Apple is a marketing firm that sells subpar products. I mean, hey, look, we got video phone now. Okay, everyone else has had it for five years, but the way they package it, their marketing, their music, um, you know, America's pretty fickle. They buy into that pretty easily, and obviously, have been buying their products. Yeah, you know, I personally have been on the uh, on the bearish tinge for Apple for a while now. I actually finally got out of the uh, the gilded prison of iPhone just about a month ago, and I hopped, I jumped ship to the Droid X, and I am I am loving and I am loving Android and all the freedom that it allows. I I, uh, I got rid of my uh, iPhone in July, and I am also a uh, Android user. So you know, I've been thinking. I was waiting to see if uh, if iPhone came to uh, Verizon, but you guys just like Android flat out better, huh? Well, you know, I like a phone that can actually make a call from time to time. And our listeners, yeah. <laughs> our listeners who aren't in Chicago may not be uh, familiar with this, but in Chicago, the iPhone is pretty much a brick when anything beyond data. And uh, so, uh, so for me, after being two years of having just uh, just an unusable phone with me, I decided that anything that had a connection was was better, and let alone something that actually can get data. And you know, now we're seeing Android handsets are catching up. If you add up all the different handsets, running that operating system is surpassing Apple on a daily yeah. activation yeah. rate. Yeah, and, well, uh, and speaking of Android, this brings up a, uh, and I know that we're, you know, we're still talking market. 
uh, Research in Motion has earnings coming out in about 10 minutes, okay? So I thought, um, you know, they're another company that is heavily involved in the, uh, you know, the smartphone technology. Sadly, they're kind of, they've kind of turned into the General Motors of smartphones. Um, but, uh, you know, you know, whereas they're, they're slow, they're the, the establishment, they're the biggest market share, but, you know, they're not coming up with newer, more innovative technologies, although BlackBerry Messenger is supposedly, my wife loves BlackBerry Messenger, but, um, you know, it's supposedly a really kind of, it, they're losing a lot of ground, similar way General Motors was in the 80s and 90s, and they have earnings coming out in about, uh, let's see, about five minutes. I thought it might be interesting. Do you guys want to chit chat a little about what uh, what paper we've seen in 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 RIM? You know, poor RIM. You know, they they were the leader in this, and I maybe you were down there as well, Mark. I don't know, but I remember when uh, when RIM launched their pit back on the SIBO, and it mm -hmm. was the place to be. People were fighting to get in there. That was the you know that was the new uh, the new kind of dawning realm of the PDA at the time. And yep. they were the leader in it. And now they've since just been eclipsed. And uh, the new thing they just came out with, I believe, I forgot what they call it, the Torch, which is kind of a hybrid BlackBerry <laughs> slash iPhone, is tanking. Uh, no one is buying the thing. And so uh, yeah. I, personally, I probably wouldn't be surprised to see these earnings be pretty bad. And it looks like the market is kind of agreeing. The stock's, stock's about 46.70 right now. And there's still a buck 25 bid for these SEP 45 puts that have one day to go. So, yeah, I know. Well, so, that's, that's it's definitely it's, an overnight play without yeah, exactly. Oh, exactly. yeah. I mean, this is an incredible play. The thing that I've been interested in, and this is why, you know, I'll tell you, they're not going out of business tomorrow, and somebody may want to buy them. You never know. Um, and, and there's still some value in a company that makes some money. And sentiment has been so bad in this stock that uh, the paper I'm seeing, and I'm going to get this out real quick, is the biggest trade we've seen has been a buyer of the September, October 50 call spread. He's been selling the September, buying the uh, October. And what this impl is implying is that we're going to get right now Rims trading about 46.65, up about a buck 13. Uh, what he's basically, they're basically betting is that Rim is going to rally mm, 5%, you know, a little more, maybe 10% uh, at the most. And the volatility on the September 50 calls is going to get smoked. And the, the OC 50s will come in, but not at the same rate as the September. And if this guy's right, uh, you can buy the spread, the SEPOC spread, for about 95 cents. That spread will return, uh, if we pay in 50, about 210 bucks with a um, probably a real a real loss that you could lose of about $60. So it's a really interesting spread. Um, you know, sentiment is so bad that I feel like the downside is not really that big of a risk just because unless something abysmal comes out. And the upside is really where um, a lot of the paper is betting. Uh, so I'll be really interested to see uh, what we what happens with, with this. But the volume on the SEP AC 50 spread, they've traded the SEP AC 50 spread 35,000 times. It is just unbelievable volume, okay? And, uh, and, and so I'll be really interested to see what happens. What do you guys have any thoughts? Well, I think it's neat about that with the earnings plays. You get 77 cents a premium for one night. Now, granted, yeah. the beauty of options is that you get to have your risk management in place, and you can do this with a smaller section of your portfolio. These are the types of trades that you put in the speculative section to where, uh, like you said, Mark, there's not a lot of risk involved. Between in the next two days, or I'm sorry, in the next 23 hours and one minute, so to speak, you yeah. get $80 in time premium for the September 50 calls. And mm -hmm. that's something that can be very attractive. And if, if for some reason it doesn't work, then you're out $90 approximately plus commissions. Mm -hmm. and that's a u very unique opportunity. And the other yeah. thing, you can do it to the downside as well. Yep. That's always well, a yeah, interesting I, play, I, double calendar. I, I agree with you guys, but I like the premium in here as well. I mean, what about the 45, 47 and a half strangle? Uh, almost three bucks, a dollar eighty a premium. Uh, I mean, this thing, you know, I know it's up a buck right now, but 
uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of vol in there, a lot of premium for, like Mike said, 23 hours, uh, 59 minutes. Or, um, I, I think selling premium is the way to go. Yeah, for our premium writers, this is looking like it's a just a uh, an opportunity uh, from heaven for these guys. I mean, yeah, you, like you said, you can write these you know out of the money puts already for a buck thirty, and there's there's some still some substantial bids in these SEP forty fives. Oh yeah. See, and and that's that's my thought is that um, sentiment is so bad, and I don't think long term that I that this is a great stock, but sentiment is so bad that we may get a little bit of kind of a snap up pullback if, if anything positive comes out at all. That's that's kind of my what I'm looking at. So but yeah, you're right. Long term, ugh, no thank you. <laughs> and usually the trading block is a little bit more macro in in nature, but today there's a lot of good stuff to dive into on a few hot trading names right now. And now we will continue that trend by moving on into the odd block. The odd, the odd block. 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 <laughs> this is the segment where we dive into some of the unusual options activity that we've been seeing today. And we did a little bit of that re in the previous segment, but now we're going to go in a little more depth. Starting out with uh, Williams Companies, Inc., ticker symbol WMB. This is a natural gas producer. And uh, we're seeing one trader coming in looking to put on a pretty size strangle in this stock. The stock's down about 4% today, around 1830. And looking that lower expected natural gas prices have been hitting their stock with analysts cutting their forecasts. And uh, we saw a trader come in today. He bought the uh, 10,000 of the Jan 20 calls for 90 cents. And he also bought 10,000 of the Jan of the 17 half put for $1.10. So that net premium he paid of $2 for this. Jan 2017 half strangle. So he's pretty much right around where the uh, where the stock is trading right now at about 18 and a half. So he's got a little bit of break even. If stock has got to drop down to 15 half on the downside, as well as up to about 22 for him to uh, for him to start breaking even on this trade. But he's listed as obviously someone who's expecting some significant movement in the uh, in the natural gas area right now, with him putting some substantial premium behind that trade. Okay, I was just going to say that it looks to me like a, a natural gas itself that overall implied volatility has remained somewhat steady recently. Uh, but on WMB, it looks like it's come down quite a bit from, excuse me, earlier over in, in April, probably about 20% on the overall implied volatility. So, Which has been very different from the implied, the implied volatility of your natural gas, Mike Tusa. Oh, I walked right into that one, didn't I? <laughs> that's, why we don't that's why we don't record in the same room. <laughs> Just remember, I know the strangle very well there, Sebastian. <laughs> so. Well, speaking of strangle action, this is, I guess, the day for strangles. You saw another strangle going up in uh, Conagra Foods, C-A-G. Uh, this is a company that makes stuff like Hebrew National Hot Dogs and Chef Boyardee and uh, all those kind of uh, canned processed foods we see up on the uh, in the supermarket on a regular basis. And these guys are lighting up the uh, the unusual volume charts these days that they're up after someone came in and sold again, again in January. January is the hot month. This guy sold a strangle in the Jan... Uh, Jan 2011. The stock right now is down to about $22. It's down about 2% after analysts cut their cut their uh, their price target on the stock. And this strangle trader, he sold 2,000 Jan 24 calls for 30 cents, and he sold 2,000 of the Jan 21 puts for 70 cents for a nice round one dollar worth of premium. And the stock's got to drop down to about below 21 or up to above 24 before expiration for him to really start uh, feeling the pain on this trade. And again, we have the inverse situation to the previous trade where this trader obviously thinks that the uh, processed food market isn't going anywhere anytime soon, at least not before uh, January expiration. What do you guys think? I mean, is it possible with that that maybe he's combining this with a stock position? 
Like maybe he's just he has he has a stock position and he's looking to add to add covered calls to it and then take on more premium and by possibly trying to get more get a greater position in the stock by getting it put to him at the uh, the put the short put level. It might be you know sometimes if they were doing that you might see him overweighting one leg or the other. You know this is a a, a fairly even two thousand contracts okay. on each leg. So, I mean it's possible it's, and that brings up a good point. You know in the options market. We never really know what the hell the other guy is up to, uh, so it can be any one of these these things. But we look at the, some of the more reasonable ones. But that's a good point. He could have a he could have some underlying equity position that that gives him a vested interest in one leg of the strangle versus another. It seems like a light uh, kind of a light uh, light vol- volatility to sell. I don't you know if if this guy doesn't have something against it, I, I would if I was involved with his trading firm. I would kind of ask him why he felt the need to sell something like this. It just seems too cheap to me. It, it, you know, I don't think that the it, the risk reward probably, you know, in my opinion, just isn't there. Yeah, I mean, um, go go back to what we were just saying a few minutes ago, where uh, you know, front month at the money strangles that are far out of the money in rim are trading for more than this, and this guy is selling Janval for it was, it was about like it looks like it was in the high teens that level. Uh, the implied vol on Conagra is up to about twenty one and a half right now after he sold this strangle. But I agree with you; it, it is a pretty uh, light premium level to be hitting for two thousand uh, two thousand times. Yeah, for all we know, he could have something against it. That, like you said, that's that's the thing about uh, options. You never know exactly what the guy's trying to do. So, and then the next name we have lighting up the charts is P. F. Chang's China Bistro, which is P. F. C. B. And that's another one making me kind of hungry hearing that name coming up on the tape. But uh, we had what well, we had cake in our previous sessions, and now we have China Bistro. So we have a food theme. We just had Hebrew nationals. We have, I think we have a theme going to our unusual activity in the odd block. And we're seeing a lot of bearish traders uh, lighting up the tape in P.F. Chang's today. They're diving into these put options. The stock is uh, down about 8.5%, at least it was in the morning, down to about 43 and a half. And looks like the traders are loading up. What's interesting about this is they're loading up on SEP puts. Uh, they were loading up on the SEP 45 puts, which at the time when they were buying them were still out of the money puts. Uh, they were loading up at them for about 85 cents. Think about this: if you get another, if you're going to move anything like today, uh, you can go out. You probably could go out and buy the uh, the 45 puts on the cheap. You know, even at the absolute lows, where were those 45 puts trading today? Um, you know, somebody came in and bought a bunch of the 45 puts. Let me see here. Pulling up the time and sales on PF Chang's. They ran up to wow, 85 cents. Um, yeah, it's wow. They bought them on the low. They're probably regretting the purchase because the stock, those puts went out 15 at 30. Um, so that just goes to show you about some of the foibles of expiration trading. You can think you've got something brilliant, but, um, the gamma is so explosive the day before and the day of earning of expiration that you buy something, it moves 80 cents on you, and you've lost more than 60% of your investment. So that would be something that's kind of something I would advise a lot of uh, a lot of would-be traders is you know what? Expiration trading is really difficult, it's really hard. Um, most of these expiration trades lose, and especially if you're paying a decent premium for something that's out of the money, uh, there are probably better pr- better plays that will not lose so much. You really have to understand the gamma effect on those puts if you're going to go out and buy them. So uh, my guess is this guy got, got it pretty good today. So. Well, that's the thing. A lot of people, it's it's like the uh, the temptation. You see that juicy premium for just one day. Because after all, what's the worst that can happen in one day? What's the likelihood of that? Uh, Rim trading at forty eight seventy right now. It's currently up two dollars and twenty cents from the closing price. Two dollars wow. and forty cents. Um, so there's that just, one day example. <laughs> just, just saying. Just saying. <laughs> That's the thing. And a lot Not of people just saying I was that. right. Just saying I was right. Um, oh, yeah, so it looks like uh, whatever uh, incremental news they put out was just enough to uh, to edge them to the upside. Of course, yeah, this, 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 yep. this is a, this is immediate post earnings uh, after hours vacillation. I wouldn't be surprised to see this you know bump around quite a bit before it settles into the actual range of where we're looking. But it looks like the immediate trend is to the upside a bit. Yeah, 
Yeah. So. Um, so hey, those SEP forty-five puts are looking really good. Forty-nine yeah. and a half for rim. Yep, this thing's on on the march. So I'll be interested to see where it goes. Well, our well, my bet is that it it right around for, in between forty-nine and fifty bucks is where we open tomorrow. If I had to guess, uh, just based on the fact that uh, just this fifty call spread was the most telling thing I've seen. I mean, it was unbelievable. Um, with that many 50s going up, you kind of have to pin at the 50 strike of these days. I, yeah, I agree. So Looks like it's weakening it up a bit now. It just hit 48 half. It just printed. Yeah, so well, it's, it's vacillating all over the place, you know. Yeah, who knows where we're actually going to be. I mean, obviously, we're going to run around. It's a volatile stock. But, um, but yeah, you know, uh, it's just kind of real interesting, real interesting. So it's another tip for the listeners that are looking to hedge some of their gamma in the after hours market, particularly after earnings, is uh, you make sure you, you, you wait for it to settle in a bit because you're going to get some crazy prints in the few minutes right after the announcement is made. And I've seen people get things, you know, a couple dollars out of the away from where the stock is actually trading on just some random errant prints. So uh, if you're working positive gamma, that can be a good thing. If you're working negative gamma yeah. hedges, that could really come into uh, to that budget. Is- more often than not, one of the things, yeah, I would agree with you. You know, if you're working a lot gamma, getting that offer in there, um, you know, they can't print through you. So if they're going to really run that thing up, you're going to get a nice fill on it. Um, you know, you 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 can really get a nice a nice trade there if uh, if things run up. Well, so we'll keep an eye on Rim while we run through some of the rest of the uh, unusual activity we got going here. We saw. Uh, Hog, Harley Davidson put up some interesting uh, numbers these days too. The stock's trading about 28. Uh, the implied vol's up a little bit today, and we saw this thing trading about 20,000 contracts right into the immediately a couple hours into the session when this name usually prints about 6,000. So it's several times the uh, the average daily volume we're seeing going up. It was a 10 to 1 ratio of calls to puts with the uh, SEP 28 and OC 29 31 calls going up the largest. The stock's been a little bit range bound lately, like the 22 to 28 range. So we're seeing the stock trading right now at the high end of that range. But uh, we're seeing right now people are still coming in thinking this is a, a fairly uh, a fairly decent bet and loading up on these uh, on these a variety of call strikes here. Thinking that I guess I guess they feel that uh, the Akval is a decent buy here. We also saw some uh, late breaking trading here and some other names like Xerox XRX. We saw some really size options volume out there today with. Close to 100,000 options on the tape before even about 1 o'clock, which is this is a stock that normally puts up an average daily volume of about 6,000 contracts. So you're talking a 15 times increase in uh, average daily volume. That is pretty much the definition of unusual activity right there. And we saw heavy interest (laughs) in the calls with about 90,000 calls going up versus 3,000 puts. Uh, The bulk of that in a, in a Jan seven half nine call spread that traded thirty five thousand times for somewhere in the dollar to one dollar dollar five range, and it looked kind of like they sold it. Mark, is that what you're seeing on your numbers as well? Yeah, well, what I saw, yeah, was they sold a call spread, and it wasn't just an outright sale though. And this is why you have to look at the open interest. You know, unusual volume doesn't mean anything if you know a a, a big call sale means little if the guy is closing a position, all right? There's a big difference between opening and closing. Closing means the guy is basically done. Opening means, you know, the guy is making his bet. What happened with the Xerox is that he was long the four to the seven and a half calls. You'll notice the open interest almost almost exactly with uh, the volume today. And then he rolled it up to the nine. So he got more bullish he wanted to he wanted to get more gamma more bullish and possibly lock in a little bit of a winner on this rally so our final name in the odd block for today is pfg or principal financial group this is another one that put up some interesting unusual numbers with about thirty thousand contracts going up on the tape compared to an average daily volume of just about 2300 again this was volume heavily weighted towards the calls with nearly all of them 29,400 of those contracts being calls and it looked like the bulk of that was an OC 25 27 call spread put up at some interesting prices and some interesting uh, splits on there and I think Mark you had some more information on that one as well yeah I thought it was a um, you know what like we're gonna have him on Charles Cottle call a slingshot trade where the stock has, you know, made this guy some money, 
he wants to sell covered calls but doesn't want to kill his upside. So what does he do? You know how to – the easiest way to sell covered calls – but to not completely destroy your upside is to actually sell call spreads instead of selling calls. If you are long a stock and you want to sell covered calls against it, um, but don't want to give up the upside, uh, the complete upside, like your, your fear that the stock could really, really take off, then the best, the best you could do is actually what you could do is actually sell a call spread. So what you're risking is the cr is the space in between that call spread uh, ver less the credit that you take in. But if the stock really runs up, you're not limited on your upside. You can actually start making money again on your upside. It, it's it's a nice little hybrid to the standard covered call. And uh, our friend Charles Cottle that we're going to be having on uh, calls it a slingshot. And, you know, that, that wraps up the odd block. And with that, we will move into the spread block. The spread block brought to you by Options Express. Options Express lets you trade futures and now foreign futures, too, where and when you want. From advanced charting and free daily trading ideas to automated systems trading and free educational resources, Options Express is the online broker for all traders. Visit OptionsExpress.com to open your free account. Futures involve substantial risk and are not appropriate for all investors. Please read this disclosure statement for futures and options available at OptionsExpress.com slash futures risk or by calling 1-888-280-8020 prior to applying for an account. Options Express is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. Okay, welcome to the spread block, and this is the segment of the show where we discuss some interesting customer activity that they're seeing over in the Options Express book. So with that, I will hand you over to John Grigas, and he will take it away. So John, it's all yours. Thanks again, Mark. Uh, you know, working at this uh, trade desk here, we do get a lot of calls, and of course it's expiration, so we're fielding the expiration calls. But one thing in particular, because it is the uh, triple witching uh, tomorrow, we are getting a lot of calls on the ETF dividend. Um, if you're unfamiliar with that, uh, ETFs such as the SPY, the Diamonds, obviously the Quad Q, uh, formerly known as the Triple Qs, uh, XLU and XLE, they all have, uh, they all trade X dividend tomorrow. Uh, and what that means for our option holders is uh, you may have assignment risk and dividend risk. Um, so what we're doing today, we're, we're trying to contact, reach out to these customers because in some cases uh, you could have a, uh, you know, a bull call spread or a debit spread on. Think you're safe, uh, you know, your short call may be slightly out of the money and you worry that, uh, you know, do I have early assignment risk? Well, of course I don't because I'm slightly out of the money or two, there's, you know, 10, 20, maybe even 30 cents of time premium in there. Well, with a dividend uh, in the SPY of 57 cents, um, and people that want to take, you know, delivery or they want this dividend or along the calls, we're going to receive hundreds, if not thousands, of exercise notices tonight. And what that means is that if you're short these calls, you're going to be early assigned. You're going to be responsible for that dividend. We'll just say, oh, hey, I, well, I own the call. I'm in a bull call spread or a cred spread, or you know, I'll just exercise my long leg. What's well, too late? You know, these these are going to trade X dividend tomorrow, and you'll be liable for that dividend amount. Um, and in some cases, it could be hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. So we're, we're fielding a lot of calls on that. People that aren't calling in, we're trying to reach out to them. You know, Options Express, we really put the customer's interests uh, first, and we want to see them succeed, and we want them to be successful and grow with us. Uh, so we're reaching out to these customers, letting them know that they do have dividend risk. And what we're suggesting to do is um, either roll out to, to a different uh, month, uh, roll up to a different strike if they're uh, you know short some calls and they're uh, nearer in the money, uh, or they're uh, or they're closing out their spreads entirely. Um, have you guys had any familiarity with this type of risk before? You know, I think that's a great point you bring up about uh, dividend risk in ETFs because ETF options are you know definitely the hot thing. They've been growing exponentially, especially in the retail sector over the past couple of years. We see most of our users coming to us looking to trade any sort of. Uh, 
commodity or whatever it might be, and they always choose ETFs, even the financials. But a lot of them are ignorant of some of these uh, you know, mechanics and logistical details, like the fact that they are obligated for dividends on these ETF options. I think that's a great point to bring up for many of our listeners who are sitting at home right now, probably scratching their heads saying, wow, I wonder if I have some, uh, some dividends coming due on some of my uh, ETF option positions. So uh, maybe they'll be getting a call from you, John, in the, uh, in the near future. Yeah, we sent out uh, thousands of emails this morning. They've been calling uh, all day to, uh, to, you know, to speak with a broker and learn what their risk is and learn how to uh, manage their risk. I mean, the biggest thing about trading options is managing risk. Um, other calls that we're, we're uh, seeing today, um, again, like I said, expiration calls. Uh, we had a lot of people selling uh, premium on Crocs uh, last week. If uh, you were unfamiliar with the move it had, um, late last week, stock was trading near $14. I think it ended a uh, two or three day slide somewhere near $10. So you're looking at a 30% move uh, in, a, in a stock you know th- that makes rubber shoes. I can't under- imagine why they've, they've sold off so much. Uh, I know years ago they were around $75, actually traded all the way down to a dollar. But you know, a lot of people saw that premium again, it came in, sold premium. So now we're seeing them close it out uh, for some decent profits. Um, We've heard the death knell sounded for Crocs so many times now that I've come kind of uh, kind of in, in almost inured to it now. It reminds me of back when I was in the SPX and when Yeltsin was running Russia, we'd hear the uh, the Yeltsin death call but every three days. This time Yeltsin's really dead. And uh, Crocs, the same thing. Crocs has been all over the map. Uh, we actually have some special affinity for Crocs on the options inside. Not the shoes. I think they're terrible. But for the, uh, the name, because it was one of our first really big, unusual activity spikes that really put our site on the map. We uh, did some content on Crocs. This is years ago now. And then uh, within the next day, we saw you know thousands of people coming in reading that content. That really kind of helped kick off the, uh, the Options Insider. So as much as I may hate those terrible rubber shoes, I, uh, I have a special place in my heart for Crocs and their Options activity. And yeah, they're back up to $11. Who would have thought they would still have life in them after all these, uh, after all these whipsaws and swings? Yeah, they do seem to be coming back. Uh, another individual equity that we're getting a lot of calls on is uh, Amazon. Um, a lot of people in uh, bull call spreads, this thing has been trending higher. Um, looking at it right now, I, I like to use the uh, quote detail page on the Options Express platform. kind of gives you a breakdown of all the important factors that are needed to uh, you know, make some quick decisions. We have uh, earnings on there as well as uh, you know, fundamentals, uh, dividend releases, and their amounts. But uh, looking at Amazon, the trading... Uh, Let's see here, about 148. 148, so that would put them at, uh, what, about $4 off their 52-week high? I'm looking at uh, Amazon's 52-week high. So they're trading at 148, as Mark said. 52-week high of 151. You know, I always, you know, we talked about Apple earlier in the show, real close to their 52-week high. Most of these stocks, in my uh, experience, like to test that 52-week high. You get all the way up here, you know, you're going to put your head up there and see uh, if there's any buy stops, uh, anything you can trigger to push this thing higher. But a lot of our customers have been in bull call spreads, been doing well uh, in this trade. I did. I like it. Free shipping. I don't, I don't own Amazon personally, but went over and talked to somebody that owned a Kindle, got to play around with it. I got a feeling that the Kindle itself is a big uh, revenue for Amazon. Uh, lightweight, holds 3,500 different books. Um, you know, myself, I like to uh, cozy up on the couch with a with a nice book by the fireplace every once in a while, but this does seem to be the Dogging future. <laughs> I, you know, the, curious, the, curious why that went, went with no comments, but uh, more <laughs> Coco. <laughs> yeah. The Amazon discussion does feed back into the Apple discussion very nicely, actually, because these two are actually going toe to toe quite a bit over this past year, more so than they have in the past. But yeah, primarily with the Kindle. They've cut the price of the Kindle quite a bit now. And with you know Apple trying to position the iPad as an e-reader, Amazon is fighting back with uh, drastic price cuts. In fact, I think this just yesterday, the day, a couple days ago, they came out with their first ever ad for the Kindle, and it targets the iPad directly. It has a, uh, a guy going up to a woman in a pool and saying, how are you reading that iPad, uh, that, that device in the sunlight? And she holds it up, and oh, it's a Kindle. And you know, I could read it in the sun. And the implication was that you know the iPad is a piece of crap because you can't read it in the sunlight. And but I think Amazon's done one interesting thing. I think with the Kindle and with a lot of their businesses, which I think is interesting to me, is that they've divided the teams. So there's a hardware team for the Kindle and a software team for the Kindle, and they're actually competing, which is actually 
actually a great way to run that business. The software team is allowed to make all the deals they can to promote that business, which is selling ebooks, even doing things like opening up an Amazon ebook store on the iPad, in iTunes. Uh, so you can get an app and buy them directly on the iPad. And you think that would hurt their hardware sales, but the hardware guys are coming out now and setting up deals to distribute the hardware in Best Buy. So by having two competing internal teams pushing that product line, it really seems to have helped them make them more efficient. They've got a price point that they're that people seem to be happy with now and a feature set. And it seems to be holding its own toe-to-toe pretty well with the iPad. So these two stocks are probably going to move in lockstep a lot more often going down the road as they continue to snipe at each other over their tablet slash e-readers. Yeah, I mean, looking at the charts, Amazon and Apple, I mean, they look like uh, an overlay. Uh, similar moves. Uh, and back to that Kindle, I mean, 60 seconds to download a book, $10 a book, $3,500, bucks, all within you know, the palm of your hand. Um, you know, all this research that I have in front of me, I pulled right off the Options Express Research Center that streams all the you know, latest news in any particular security, uh, Dow Jones Newswire, and a whole bunch of other content that you can use to, you know, to find out why these stocks are making their move. We also include the S&P reports uh, that you've heard me talk about in earlier segments or earlier shows. Um, all information you need right at the tip of your hands to make, uh, to make that choice on what stock to get into. Um, besides those two securities and the uh, ETFs uh, dividend that is X dividend tomorrow, a lot of, lot of exploration questions. You know, um, a lot of people like here like trade condors. What's, what happens sometimes at expiration is that you find yourself in between those two strikes. Um, Options Express provides a lot of assistance to new clients, uh, new to online trading, maybe new to Options Express, or new to uh, derivatives or options trading. Um, we're getting fielded a lot of questions about what do I do tomorrow? Um, you know, how much time do I have? You know, what's what's my best m- way to manage my risk in these uh, these type of spreads? Um, but other than that, yeah, it's been been expiration questions uh, all week long. Now, do they still give you free lunch on expiration Friday over there? Uh, they do, and they do it uh, Monday morning as well, or Monday uh, after expiration, which is which is usually our busiest day because that's when you wake up Monday morning to think that your options expired worthless, and you're figuring out where you want to spend your premium that day when you realize, okay, that you know I traded higher and I was assigned, and now I got to figure out what I got to do, and I got to call Options Express. Oh, miss the free lunches though. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, uh, hey, John. I have another question for you. Going back to that, uh, to the dividend trade tip for a second. You know, we've seen a lot of uh, smoke and fire over the whole dividend trade explosion in the options market over the past couple of years, and there's a lot of concern that it really is confusing the retail customer, particularly ones who are just coming into the option space. They're starting to u- learn how to use unusual activity and things like open interest to track trading in these underlyings. And then they see these massive explosions of essentially fake volume in these big dividend trades going up for millions of contracts at a time. So I'm curious if you're getting a lot of calls in the Options Express call center when, whenever these big trades go up. Are people confused? And what do they have to do? Are they being assigned? Are you seeing a lot of uh, impact from those? Or is it pretty much a non-event for you guys? Uh, anytime that you see big open interest or big big volume on a particular strike, we do get people, you know, that keep their eye on certain securities will call in and say, hey, what are you hearing about, you know, the 100,000 uh, contracts have gone up and they had the money calls on the SPY. And, you know, we do see that on the quarterly dividends. And we just, then it's a great opportunity for us to explain to them, you know, what this dividend play is and what their risks are. Yeah. Well, John, thank you very much for that uh, for that insight into what's going on there on the uh, Options Express customer side. And now we're going to move from the spread block right into the strategy block. Hmm. The strategy block. And the strategy block is where we kind of break down some interesting trades or strategies that we feel might be relevant in the current market conditions or just might be feeding off a lot of the input we're seeing from our various constituencies at our websites. And uh, Mike, I'm going to hand this to you for this one. What strategy shall we discuss today? Well, what I'd like to talk about today is the covered call. Uh, With the market rally going as it has, uh, there's a lot of covered call traders out there. The covered call is a very popular strategy. Uh, not only for beginners, for but for advanced option traders as well. And 
Oftentimes when the covered call is pitched to people or when people first learn about it, they don't necessarily hear about what to do should the stock go in the money. So for example, if you XYZ stocks at 50 and you sold the 55 call, maybe you got a dollar for the call option you sold, you're excited because you're getting a little 2% profit. And even if the stock does go up to 55, well, I, I'm still happy because I'm gonna make a nice profit on it overall. But when the stock goes to 58 or 59, and you're realizing that you missed out on even more of the upside, questions come up about, well, what can I do? And what I wanna go over today are some things with which you can do when your covered calls actually go in the money. Uh, the first choice that you have, and there's no right or wrong answer for this, you just need to be aware of what your choices are, and you need to have a plan going into the trade as to what would be the best method of doing it for your situation. First method is to just do nothing. If you sold an out of the money covered call, if you sold an in the money or an at the money, your stock is above your maximum profit point. You're making the most amount of money that you could have possibly made in the trade to begin with. So by doing nothing, your covered call is in the money and all you're waiting for basically is for expiration Friday to come. You're staring at the clock. It's like when you're in a, a football or a basketball game and you're, it looks like you have the game wrapped up halfway through the fourth quarter. You're just trying to play things out and hopefully the stock doesn't go down too much in the meantime. Uh, so that's one thing with which you can do. And once it's expiration Friday and the stock is in the money, you can just call, get called out and know that you made your maximum profit. Now with that, understand that there'll be tax implications if this is not an IRA, that needs to be part of your plan. And also, you need to be aware of the fact that the stock will not be there over the weekend, so to speak. So if the stock uh, does find the cure for cancer or if they go bankrupt to the upside or to the downside, you need to be aware that the stock can move over the weekend without you go, being a part of it. How do you go bankrupt to the upside, just out of curiosity? No, if they go bankrupt or, uh, oh. if, it's an either or, I thought I said that. <laughs> now, now, no picking apart poor Mike over there. Oh, yeah. No, I okay. still got my strangle ready for you. I buddy. know, I know. <laughs> Some other uh. things you can do with it. There's no, I, I did a presentation a couple of years back and uh, someone had asked me, well, I think it's more risky to, uh, stay in the cover call. And I said, well, it, it just kind of depends on where you're, what you're looking at. You can get out of the covered call early for a lesser profit. There will still be time decay left in that call option with which you sold, but the overall trade will be the, will be profitable overall, most likely. Uh, unless there's some type of crazy volatility skew of some sort, you're going to be profitable. And there's no law that says you're not allowed to buy to close the short call and sell the stock all within one trade and you can get out and you don't have to worry about the downside stock risk. So you, you can get out early on a covered call going in the money. Now, another thing with which you can do, let's say that maybe you're just a little bit in the money and you think the stock maybe could go up a little bit higher. Perhaps you can buy to close the current month covered call and then sell to open one maybe two or three months out out of the money and it won't cost you anything to do so. Now, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. You need to have a bullish stance in order to do that. And number two, you need to be ready for the risk of the stock going down in the time frame with which you plan on holding it. Now, let's say you go the route of getting called out and you actually are flat, but you're, you still want to get back into the stock. Well, one thing that you can do is sell a cash secured put. Now, beginners may or may not know this, but cash secured puts and covered calls are really the exact same thing when it comes to risk and reward. By selling a cash secured put, you're getting paid to take on the risk of that stock. It's, a, it's the identical risk reward of a covered call, and you can still get back into it. So. Uh, the message with which I want to give from the strategy block for this week is that you have choices in terms of what you can do once a covered call goes in the, in the money. Uh, with options, it's a very versatile thing, and that's why we think it's important that you know your options. <laughs> I like that. Oh, I, I like that. Well done. I know. You know, the, se that. the segues and the tosses are my job, but I'll, I'll let you have a few every <laughs> now and then. 
The uh, <laughs> but you know, Mike, I think that's 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 important to mention too because the conventional wisdom with covered call writing is that you write the call, the stock rallies, and you're happy because it rallied through your stock, and that's kind of it. You let it run away. But you know, the truth is, there are a lot of different ways you can approach that. You don't have to just sit there and say, "Oh, maybe I'll do another trade," or "I'll and I'll leave this one on till expiration." You can unwind part of it. You can roll it into different trades. So there's a lot of a lot of different opportunities for traders who think maybe, "Wow, I'm I'm stuck here now. I've got this covered call on." And uh, and I, nothing else and I could do. You can convert it into a slingshot trade, like we were talking about with the, our uh, our friend that was trading uh, PFG. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, and, there's a thousand different things. Just because it blows through that short doesn't mean you're done. Okay, you can absolutely move along with the with the ride on that. Rim trading fifty thirty five right now. <laughs> You're just trying to rub in my upside comment, aren't you? Um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, yeah, I think that that's no, the. I'm just trying to rub in the uh, the call spread that I bought at uh, at one thirty this afternoon. <laughs> oh, there you go. The uh, yeah, I guess lunch is on you next week. Um, but um, yeah, I think the takeaway from that is exactly you're not done when the stock hits your short or blows through your short. You still have a lot of options, pun intended, that you can pursue without having to be sit there and just be stuck through expiration. With that, I think we'll close up the strategy block this week, and we will move on to our final segment, which we call Around the Block. Around the Block. Around the block or is kind of like our What's Trading Week Ahead segment where we look at some of the events that are coming up in the near future. One of the ones we've already covered live throughout the show, which is, of course, the RIM earnings announcement. And it uh, looks like that stock is still skewing to the upside after the event. So the market obviously happy with what RIM said. I guess the bankruptcy lookouts and the bears are have to wait another day for RIM to fall into obsolescence. Yeah, Mark, I, I, don't, I don't mean to interrupt, but you're, you just did get a margin call on your position, so you may want to take care of that. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 that that's that's the nice thing about being on the phone with Options Express Live is they can tell you that kind of stuff right away as your as your margin calls are coming in and you can act uh, act accordingly. See, you know that that strangle that fifty fifty two forty two strangle still looking pretty good. I think that is that still is that's looking great actually. Uh, <laughs> they're gonna peg, they're gonna peg that stock at fifty dollars and a penny tomorrow. And that that guy that wrote that calendar spread is gonna look be looking great. Exactly. Oh yeah. Well, that you know what it is is that there's. The, the, you know, this guy, all these people came in and bought these calendar spreads. Who do you think is keeping this stock in that fifty range, in that fifty dollar range? All the jerks that bought the September calls that are trying to scalp the gamma on on these calls, they are getting just absolutely worked over on this trade. It's unbelievable. All this, all this so. gamma hedging and gamma scalping is going to keep us right at fifty tomorrow. There's no way thirty five thousand of these fifty call spreads went up today, and we're not going to go out like John said at fifty oh one or something stupid like that. They're sitting. The New York Stock Exchange or the Nasdaq is probably sitting on, uh, you know, two and a half million shares offered at. Uh, you know, fifty fifty and two and a half million shares bid forty nine and a half. So well, that'd be my bet. Aside from the uh the rim upside explosion, what else are we looking at for uh, for the week ahead here? We got home sales. What's what what home on? sales? <laughs> Who's <laughs> buying a house these days? <laughs> Not a lot of them, but they are coming up on uh, Maybe one of these times when we might get some good news at some point. Who knows? Uh, you got core CPI tomorrow, which is always important for the uh, uh, your bond ETFs and your uh, you know your interest rate uh, complex. If you're trading futures, um, mm -hmm. you know you always got the uh, hawk in there that thinks inflation. You know we need to raise rates, but uh, it looks like inflation is, is more worried about deflation right now. Yeah, and we've got. Don't forget, we've got. Uh, you know, hate the football team, love the sentiment. We got the Michigan confidence uh, confidence coming out tomorrow. Consu uh, Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey coming out tomorrow at uh, 9:55 ES uh, Eastern Daylight Savings Time. Now, how well. can you hate the football team with a quarterback like that this year? Oh yeah, no, they're the best. Rich Rodriguez, he's the man. I love him. So yeah. 
And of course, we uh, still have this these lingering questions over uh, why the administration, particularly Geithner and those guys, have decided to raise the uh, the China currency issue now. I mean, China's been uh, doing their own currency thing for a long time, and all of a sudden, Washington decided to make it kind of bring it more into the public sector, which kind of leads to the uh, you know for the political watchers out there leads to the assumption that maybe they're going to start making this more of a public fight and try to pin some of their failure to restart the economy on Chinese China's currency moves. In which case. It's going to be a lot more uh, public back and forth about currency in China in the near future. That might be hanging over the markets for the next few weeks as well. Well, the, the good news for the Chinese is they own a trillion dollars of our debt, so I don't think they really have a lot to worry about. Yeah, they swing a pretty big stick when it comes to that. Yeah, no kidding. Well, guys, that's going to do it for our inaugural sneak peek episode of the Option Block. I hope our listeners and the Options Insider Radio Network enjoyed it. And I encourage you, if you did, to check out the various sites. Uh, if you want to know more about unusual activity, feel free to surf on over to theoptionsinsider.com. If you want to know more about uh, Mike Tussaud and his in-the-money covered call strategies, surf on over to knowyouroptions.com. If you want to know more about uh, what's going on over at Options Express, so Options Express is pretty easy to find at optionsexpress.com and then of course uh, Mark and his many various entities we'll just we'll just toss the hat over to <laughs> option pit right now we'll yeah, we'll rotate it on a weekly com. basis uh, yeah, and then uh, we'll is, where, is the hub of all and for all that is Mark Sebastian so <laughs> go to optionpit.com well, that's about all we have for this episode and we'll look forward to seeing you again in future episodes of the option block Become a part of the Option Block. Just visit www.theoptionsinsider.com slash forum to post a question for the hosts. You can also submit questions to twitter.com slash option block or leave a voicemail at 312-544-9356. Make it interesting and your question just might make it on the air. The Options Block is property of the Options Insider Incorporated. All rights reserved.